Welcome. This is the April 17th Open ZFS production user call. We have Steve, Greg, Alexander, Jan, Andrew, and myself, Michael. And uh, Alexander, you have some news on speculative prefetch work. Uh, yeah, uh, it's. I've done another round to that area. I'm doing it every few years <laughs> <laughs> this time. Uh, I improved its handling of reordered requests, reordered, re reordered writes, primarily reads, which that happens in case of multi-threaded servers such as Samba or NFS, partially iSCSI. And uh, it shows dramatic improvement of cache hits uh, and well, prefetch stream hits, which ends up with better prefetch, which then ends up with, with cache hits. And in some situation, it can, it can show dramatic performance improvements. Uh, it's been announced already on uh, FreeNAS, TrueNAS forums. It should be in uh, Dragonfish and 13.3 releases of TrueNAS. Uh, right now, it's uh, in uh, ZFS upstream in master. I just created PR to merge a bunch of things, including this into 2.2.4 ZFS. So I'm pretty anxious to see some feedback from real world whether it changed something, but I, I would expect for people where it, it, it was great, it shouldn't do much, but for people who where it was terrible, it may become significantly better, I hope so. That's often on the positive side. Uh, awesome. I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't here for a while, just uh, in case it uh, wasn't noticed. I've done another round through uh, block cloning, where I've done, I fixed it a few bugs, but also done a number of micro optimizations. So hopefully we're getting closer and closer for it to be stable and fast. But at least now, most of what's related to stability should be covered. Again, I created PR for 2.2.4, so we're getting closer. This time, I'm not aware of any crashes or anything like that. Hopefully, we'll be there soon. Uh, last week, I touched one more area. People screamed and yelled for years, and that was uh, encryption, in particularly encrypted oh, application. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I spent literally last week there. And that's madness. But I created a PR, which I hope should help. I, I'm not saying it solve all potential problems, but at least one problem that was reported uh, the most aggressively. That uh, is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you have my, PR uh, numbers handy for those for those last two or three? If convenient, great. If not, we'll go look for them. The last one, uh, 16104. It's for encryption. Okay, great. Uh, for block cloning, there was a bunch of PRs, probably about a dozen. They all labeled as BRT in a topic. Should be easy to find. Fantastic. Pre speculative prefetch was one PR. Again, by name of prefetch, should be easy to find. I may find if Cool, needed, fantastic. But... At least case that uh, Richie Kalani uh, hit with his uh, replication scenario on, on some weird Spark platform. The I don't Spark know one, why. Yes, from, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, he finally cut me with that. But once I got there, I found that locking was terrible or practically incorrect or missing. I hope my version should be better. I still can't say it's perfect and I like it very much. It's dirty, but it should work, I hope. But okay. so far, so far, I hope it's still, it should just pass CI and hopefully after that, rig tests. I can say about more. I haven't seen problem myself. For me, everything works. That's what- That is that, fantastic. Go I ahead. always told there are two kinds of people. One who tells encryption works and others that it's terribly broken. Somehow <laughs> we are from the first side. I think I had maybe three tickets for encryption over all the time in true NAS. But other people are pretty loud about it. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. And I noticed that, for example, the 
the receive well actually the the error handling is quite limited uh and so you just don't know what went wrong so hopefully that i don't know if that get that caught along with you it will work but hey that's always a surprise um i have a quick question about block cloning uh this came mm -hmm. up in taipei with Pavel that uh replication can't preserve its benefits and you pretty much want to use traditional deduplication at the destination has that come up at, and has anyone thought about super clever strategies to make it work no i think it's known issue from the day one since it was implemented or at least presented i think powell mentioned in his presentation and it's now an issue but i don't i haven't heard anybody to actually uh, was going to work on something. There was some ideas uh, like to maybe right. insert some hash and replication stream or something, but I don't think it ended anywhere. Jan, you Rich, had something? Yeah, this makes the um, use case for a user space DDRP hint system call even stronger because then Which you system could... call? Uh, there's a, a copy file range where you mm. tell it uh, uh, the source and destination should be identical, dedupe them if they are. So that you have an uh, atomic uh, compare and dedupe operation. Um, because with that, you could go the in then afterward with something that, like ZFS diff or uh, the likes and could barely replicate the stream, find everything changed, and then go to your last snapshot, re-deduplicate re uh, with the help of the FS diff, and then you would basically lose the bandwidth advantage uh, of the replication stream, but at least you wouldn't have to persist it because you could then punch in the ddup again and and then a uh, snapshot on the destination, but then you would take the expanded stream and then deed up it against its own history. Okay, cool. And I think, you know, we've just scratched the surface of that amazing technology such that both the uses and the edge cases and the advantages and shortcomings will become clear over the next few years even. Uh, somebody asked there on chat uh, whether I fix it uh, any correctness issue. There was a couple uh, kernel panics that was fixed that uh, on one side. On another side, uh, there was issue that it wasn't reported, just I found it. Well, at least it wasn't reported on FreeBSD on Linux in some configuration. It caused assertion or kernel panic, I don't remember. But uh, it, I found that... Uh, a result of block cloning, some cases could not be replicated correctly. Uh, but that's fixed. That's among the things I fixed. But that's all I could remember. Most of changes were performance optimizations. Right. Oh, like a dozen. Fantastic. Continue. <laughs> or forget my potential ignorance here, but would you really need to? traditionally worry about the um autonomous uh, atomicity at atomic atomicity atomicity there's a good word <laughs> maybe it's not um, that, whatever <laughs> uh, of the dedupe couldn't you just retain the um oh what's it called that oh, i forget what it's called but basically where that snapshot would be taken because by definition that would be atomic and then you could dedupe yes. that point. The use case I have envisioned is um, for a dirty, dirty FreeBSD jail magic uh, to uh, go in and after the jails updated themselves, have the host come in while the jails are running uh, without downtime and really do after the, the jail self managed. So, uh, and for that, uh, because I can't rely on any locking protocol because the files are potentially not locked uh, by any 
locking system call and modified concurrently, so I can't trust uh, that there is any way to prevent a race condition. With a locking protocol, so it would have to be atomic. Um, yeah. Uh, but would that be on the destination or the primary one? That would be local, not on the destination. That would right. be how yeah. you, uh, let's say I have a bunch of block cloned jails where every non-empty uh, normal file is a clone of some uh, template. And then they diverge over time. And then I can just say, go over the files, find the ones which are in one of the images by strong hash, uh, and really dupe them. With copy file range doing that is only safe when the dedupe script is the sole writer of that uh, file system. Cool. Well, any questions? Uh, for, go ahead, Alexander. Any questions for Alexander? Also, when he's done, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say that uh, it's not exactly related to replication. Just generally, uh, I can see usefulness of such feature potentially. Where if some blocks got diverged, they could be reunited. And yeah, that's it's probably it can, it can only be done on kernel level. I guess kernel could just log two files and compare checksums of two blocks, and if they're identical. Uh, activate cloning for them uh, okay. while holding the lock. So it could be done atomically, but right now, at least on FreeBZ, there is no syscalls for that. I don't remember, maybe something on Linux among the it zillions is. of yeah, what I think Linux has such a system call and it's only hooked into ButterFS right now. What, uh, what? It's, it's an iOctal or an F control hint or whatever. And because you kind of have to read the data anyway, why check some of it? Uh, and when you have to read both blocks anyways, you can just uh, compare the full data. No, I, I don't think that, uh, like, we could just rely on checksums if it's if they are strong yeah, enough. But... Or at least first checksums and then data. But just comparing checksums would be the easiest. Uh, they are already in block pointers. But if pointers. you have to read in the data to compare the checks, to compute the checksum, then... But if blocks are not written in, in this transaction group, yeah, they are, I what was I going to say? It should be trivial just to get checksums. Because you can take the block checksums if yeah. they are strong enough, but I wouldn't want to use Fletcher 4 for dedupe. <laughs> no, it, it could be first step, first compare checksums, and if they match, then potentially do yeah. more strong checks. That's one thing that could be done. Another thing that from somewhat related area, uh, people want to rebalance data without yes, uh, yeah. without oh. requiring a locking. And that actually would be another similar use case. You just lock a range of file, touch every block of, uh, of that yep. file, and drop the range lock done. So ZFS will rewrite itself back, and everybody happy. And but again, if you something. do that, you could even give it a strong hint to the allocator, potentially, if there's any way to get that through, that you want this to go heavily biased towards the new storage. Ooh, you could yeah, also if... use it for transparent uh, background uh, defragmentation. So if you have a pool where it's just badly degraded over time uh -huh. and you made a bunch of space available, you wouldn't have uh, to uh, stop writing to the file system for it to defragment itself underneath. Potentially, you could also use it to uh, come back later, even if it's not badly fragmented, but find file uh, ranges which haven't been modified in a while and uh, consider if it's worth either moving them to different devices for special allocation classes or just re-blocking the file to larger blocks so that you can have files which are unmodified uh, for long enough get re-blocked asynchronously in the background to 60 megabytes. So that you can have a kind of odd versus warm storage. Would ZFS diff help at all to keep track of you know what you want to where you want to start your dedu your uh, I guess deduplication 
file level? Uh, yes, uh, it would be very helpful there because it gives you, at least if you have the right snapshots. Mm -hmm. But what this would allow us is to, from a storage uh, efficiency perspective, get rebasable jails. Mm. Okay, cool. And as, as long as you stop the jail to rebase it, uh, you can already do it with just copy file range. Um, but that's uh, yeah, a few minutes of downtime per jail. Uh, just for the base system uh, with an unoptimized shell script, at least. You can probably get it quicker if you write a proper implementation of an improper design. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, very uh, cool. Go ahead, Alexander. Uh, rebalancing, I don't think, uh, will go anywhere. It still would be a nice feature, except there's no... I, I'm not aware about any syscall to interface it to user space while uh, like re reuniting uh jails for, for that side maybe just dedupe would work easier uh just we need to we need to fix a dedupe which is uh, at least partially improved one we have now in review i gradually going through another round of reviews science that was pub published um, in prs uh, and uh, guys are working on it updating it for according to those uh, reviews, so what much more reviewers actually needed, it's going pretty slow. So, if anybody is interested, please by any means jump in and look what's there. But, uh, at the end, uh, I hope it, it should not proper working dedupe should not be as terrible as it is now. And uh, actually, to be fair. Block cloning is not as cheap, according to my test, as I would like it to be. It's cheaper than dedupe, but uh, not dramatically cheaper once you start using the on many small blocks. So at the end, they may converge somewhere in one point with dedupe getting cheaper and block cloning getting more functional, but maybe not so much cheaper. But so at it, least uh, block cloning doesn't... Uh impose a cost on the right path of non-cloned uh, blocks. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's true, but uh, if with uh, different mechanisms such as uh, quota, or DDT quota and other things, it's now actually possible to implement some mechanisms like don't try to dedupe blocks smaller than X. Or like if you have too many of those blocks that never deduped, wipe them from DDT table. Or like if table get too big, wipe them and then compact the table. There are just ways to make dedupe not so horrible. So yeah, sure, it, it, it will remain more expensive by requiring more expensive checksums and still DDT table is slightly bigger, even so not dramatically. And the table just... is in the right path, whereas with block cloning, the DDoP file has to opt in. No, yeah, sure, DDoP. Uh, but uh, again, if you try to benchmark uh, DDoP, it's not like it, it, it's instant. It is faster than uh, DDoP, but it's not like ten times faster. Well, it depends on what you're doing, of course. But yeah, it's it's so still with, has, uh... it is it is faster than write. But it's not like 10 times faster, maybe like two or three times faster than right. So when uh, using CP-8 to get a, a block cloned uh, copy of a complete FreeBSD 14 user land, it's a one, to one second to 1.1 seconds to do that on a desktop with a SATA SSD. Uh, which yeah, is that, like... a lot better than what you can get with uh, DDoP because DDoP then has to actually go through all the data, compute all the checksums. Uh, again, notice that it can dedupe based on a strong checksum. So you also have a requirement to either use a cryptographically strong checksum function or you have to read in the data so, yeah. Oh yeah, that, that, that's all true. I'm just saying that uh, I, ho I hope uh, for the best to, to to see block cloning like all, almost instant, but it's not exactly there at least yet. 
uh, doing some just cloning some huge files. Uh, you may see if it's it's getting limited by CPU in certain points. That would be nice if they wouldn't be there. But sure, if if you are disk bound and not copying the data, sure helps. But if you are CPU bound, then it's not so obvious. Well, if I can throw a six, uh, then two cores at one SATA SSD, I'm probably not CPU bound. <laughs> oh yeah, anything about SATA uh, SSD so. should be disk bound. Any other news, Alexander? That is all amazing. And yes. for the use case of lots of files, I'm mostly bound by the system call overhead because what I, it looks like is open dear, read dear, open read only, open write only, copy file range, close, close, next file. Hmm. So there are lots of... Uh, round trips between user space and kernel space to do a recursive file system copy. And the only way I can see to vastly improve that would be to uh, put a recursive copy uh, basically on the file level into the kernel to avoid the, um, either to avoid the cost at all or uh, an async open, close, read here and so on so that you can batch the operations. Similar uh, to what IO Uring does. I mean, FreeBSD does have a better POSIX AIO implementation than most other operating systems, but the API isn't the nicest to use unless you uh, go for FreeBSD only and use KQS uh, event notification mechanism and so on. And even then, there are no uh, list operations for. AIO list for thing for open and close because uh, you yeah all of these meta operations are synchronous only and hmm. you don't have the batched versions of them. <sighs> Anything else, Alexander? I just want to sit, mm -hmm. listen in on other activities and if people have questions, now is your chance to ask them. Uh, not particularly, I remember something, uh, as I've told, uh, block coin, uh, fast dedupe is in review, would be mm -hmm. good to move, move on. Yeah. And hopefully it would land, uh, one of PRs uh, already landed, two, uh, good to me and uh, under more review, and I think three or four more PRs are open, I need to take a look, or somebody needs to take a look on that. Hopefully it will uh, get all landed before, like as uh, Brian promised to me, uh, 2.3 release somewhere end of quarter, not Q2. Hopefully it'll get by then. Uh, but I haven't brought up the topic. 2.3, uh, not 2.3. Not 2.3? Two, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, 2.3. Uh, yeah, cool. Well, that, that's... Uh, we discussed from the point of synchronization with Prunas uh, early cycle and generally it's, we should know where to expect releases signs. Traditionally, they slipped quite a lot and that makes it unmanageable. Hmm. So uh, Trunas nightly builds are already uh, running on master branch of ZFS, so effectively on 2.3. So that way we are at least trying to bring more nice. users to that to ZFS master branch. No, and same as FreeBSD master also. Mm -hmm. so, that is on, fantastic. On. Anyway, I'll just keep saying that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. All of your work. So to shift gears ever so briefly, and we can revisit any of these topics as you please. Uh, as of yesterday, the Open ZFS Developer Summit will take place in October. I think at one year it actually fell on Halloween, but we will be just before that on the 28th and 29th. And Matt and Karen and company are open to having a production user summit or conference or whatever name we come up with that can be a mix of talks or on conference or whatever essentially you please 
the weekend before, which is 26th and 27th. So the summit has traditionally been Monday, Tuesday, because people have their weekend activities and will just will allow for some overlap with the two of these. And it's not that anyone's discouraged from attending to the other, but hey, uh, we'll kind of work out what balance is appropriate. And I think someone early on asked about cost, and I recall it being about $100 symbolic, somewhat symbolic, it's a lot for some, uh, to cover just printing costs, food costs, you name it. Uh, if anyone wants to help organize that, I know Stu is in the Portland area and very interested, but he's busy with NAB right now. And congrats to the IX Systems team for being at NAB right now. So I'm all open to ideas and uh, help and sponsors and other great things relating to that. And while I'm at it, BSD CAN is, oh gosh, a, roughly a month away. We can always use more sponsors, but we're doing quite well. And I encourage you to attend or visit because you will find almost more OpenZFS users there than you will at an OpenZFS developer summit, which is a small, humble event. So any questions regarding those? Cool. So I have two funny things I'll just fun things I'll just run through quickly. Uh, one is that I'm doing absolutely unholy things with the make FS type Z user creatable disk images based with based on ZFS and root on ZFS and FreeBSD. And one, uh, I was wondering if I can just tell the scrub to just let me know when it completes and actually have it blocking because it's a, you know, it's like a five second scrub. So I'd rather just be completely waiting on it and then just let my script continue when I guarantee it's finished rather than like exporting a pool during a scrub. So if anyone can take it away beyond the, uh, yeah, uh, dev CTL, there's that. Go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say on top of that, even if it gives some kind of output of its, if it can give some kind of output of its progress, having it kind of sit there idle would usually be useful to me because I want to sit oh. there and watch it anyway. Ah, good and point. Right uh, now, I actually have a scrub running on a machine, and so it's just repeating uh, the uh, the status on that particular array. Are you familiar with Command Watch? I'm familiar with Watch, but well, there is one on at least FreeBSD Command Watch where you just put in a a value of like one second, and it just reruns a command, which is useful yeah. for that. So you okay? So Watch and Command Watch. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with that, but. Um, the deep pool command itself, you can just stick a number on the end of it. Yes, true. Uh, which, which is what I usually do. Can you do Z pool status one and have it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, some every day. I, I usually do you something like just 30 or 60, in, uh, but one is yeah. fine as well. Just put it after the pool names because you are not allowed to uh, start a pool name with a letter. Number, yep. uh, you can have numbers go after the pool names without any ambiguity. Yes, that and is correct. There it is. So, oh my gosh. so you can just run it and then basically pass the output uh, of a pool. So find the scan line, scan colon, and then you get your report. For what it's worth, something equivalent to like DD progress would be nice. I mean, if you just have a progress bar that's yep. you know, in your console. That's exactly that's kind of what I'm thinking. Cool. Uh, I mean, the full... I have a... Progress may be difficult, but... Uh... Yeah, go ahead, Alexander, if you've got some ideas, because here's... Uh, uh, there, is a, <laughs> there seems to be zipul wait command to make actually process wait for completion of whatever you say to wait for. Ah, okay. It should be able to write specifically for scrub, specifically for dream, specifically for whatever you want. I'm not sure it has any output, but maybe it could be made just to report status regularly while it's Ooh. waiting or something like that. Okay, thank you. I, I've never used myself as there's no it's there. <laughs> uh, well, that's the first step in this. Cool. Um, and of you course, could, um... the 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 resilver estimates are initially terrible and like, oh, it'll be a week and that'll be an hour. But but hey, yeah. any improvement there is appreciated. Go ahead, Jan. Even if it doesn't produce output, 
uh, if you're not afraid of a uh, little shell script, you huh. could just run uh, the zpool status in the foreground and uh, or in the background but producing output, and then uh, wait for the other one, kill the uh, zpool status one, and uh, then you know basically. Ah, and yeah. you still get an update. And what you can also maybe filter the output from Zipo status to drop the configuration. And you can, if you want it to be truly uh, clever about it, you can do things like uh, play a bit with unzi terminal sequences to make sure you don't have an endless lock, but you're overwriting the same place every time again. Mm -hmm. If you're prepared to commit yourself to a VT100, a uh, compatible terminal, you can even set up a scroll window. So you don't have to do that. You only have to know how many lines will you let, let through through your uh, filter. And then you set up a scroll window so that it, you don't even have the output amplification because the terminal emulator will handle it for you. It's probably like five uh, escape sequences to set up. Hmm. Cool. Terminal for that, but it commits you to uh, something VT100 compatible, which is probably any Unix-like terminal emulator for in the last 30 years. <laughs> yeah, VT100 is pretty low bar. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. it's a deck specialty feature that you can select these two lines as your scroll range and then anything in between scrolls. It's not one of the common command sequences, so you need a proper VT100 emulation. Cool. Well, I will look into that. And along those lines, I found a reproducible panic on 14 release, and I've submitted a PR about an hour or so ago. Ouch. Yeah, but I'm I'm doing unholy things with these disk images. So maybe something like the uh, libzfs used by um, make image is the problem. I'm not blaming ZFS per se. And I just realized I can't test it on 14, uh, on 13 because it doesn't have the fixes that are in 14 for make image and GPT and all that. So I should try it on 15 next. Alexander, you may find that interesting. I can put the stable in the chat. What's that? Uh, you can also try 14 stable if anything oh, yeah, has course. been on the seat. Oh, well, no, that's obvious. This is, I only got the PR out like an hour ago. So I, my, my list of other things to test is coming along but the call came up and you know i'm trying to be a good host anyway uh yeah so i've got a script in there that's making it easy to reproduce and i could make it even easier if people find that downloading a vm image and uh importing a pool named zroot is a problem i have ways of fixing with that so um Let's go around the horn. Who has other topics now that we've covered Alexander's updates, my little news, event news, and uh, some cool scripting strategies? Let's see. Well, I'm going to pick on people. Greg, you're unmuted. How's it going? Anything to report? <laughs> no, it's going good. Um, got our HBA in, so now. Oh, right. Yeah, yes, I'm balancing out our a race so we won't be in the 90 percent after another day or two i guess um, that makes I, me I, happy yeah no too it makes me very happy <laughs> collective relief here yeah and that was on the last call for those who are curious what was going on but that's good news yeah um, i wasn't aware there's a different allocation algorithm that zfs use after 80 percent. That, that was pretty interesting so i went and read about that a bit oh, so. good yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, ask, uh, we, we spoke about this before and just wondering, because I know some folks here um, are very involved in it, but I, I don't want to circumvent any methods or whatever, but uh, I spoke about my concern about blowing out the uh, L2 arc cache when you're doing tape backups and that it would be nice if you could make it an exclusion somehow, either based on IP source or or something. Um, and I was just wondering, how would I get that into the ear of the people who might actually consider doing something like that when time permitted? Did you try Jan's workaround? And Alexander, if you missed that one a few months ago, I'll catch you up. Uh, Greg found that if you do a tape backup, you start touching a lot of things and well, that starts throwing them in the arc and then blowing out the data you want. So uh, I think Jan, you said mount a 
snapshot and run the backup against that, which, and then either, uh, what was your, and then maybe it was, uh, Oh, cash I think it was some nasty idea clever. to set uh, the at least the secondary uh, cache to none and potentially the primary cache uh, to metadata only uh, for this use case. I don't remember his exact use case and just that it may work, but I'm not sure if it does work as intended. Right. And I think yeah, you have a snapshot to, to make it work. Cache the results and thereby not pollute the cache. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I was also thinking about secondary cache property. If you set it to something lower, it shouldn't drop current data from cache. I don't think so. But any new accesses should not be uh, cached in the respective last level cache. Was this but, for the ASIN backup? Sorry? Uh, no, this is uh, going to tape directly to tape over NFS. Um, oh. I didn't want to install the uh, networker agent on the uh, file system because it's an appliance. So I think the recommend I considered where you just to test and report back on was to create the snapshot and as part of snapshot creation on the snapshot set the uh, primary and secondary uh, cache properties. And then NFS export the snapshot because you wanted to back up it anyway. So it makes sense to back up a snapshot and not the live file system. And if you then set the secondary cache to none on the uh, snapshot, uh, maybe it gets the read request is properly uh, <laughs> passed down uh, and is associated with the data set, in this case, the snapshot with the right caching attributes so that it that it's not uh, considered for cache uh, replacement. Sounds like you didn't get a chance to experiment with that or that it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll play around with that this week and uh, let you guys know next well, week how that went. That'd be great, but I, I do see how if you have a pretty dynamic workload, you it, snapshots might be somewhat impractical, especially with media and applications such that I'd be curious, Alexander, were you thinking bait you a, a property would say hey this this data by some criteria stays in arc even if you know the allocator is is suggesting otherwise that's not the problem he described if i remember correctly well, the... people are reviewing video let's say and the arc is valuable but then you you try to back that up simultaneously and it, it may uh, push the critical stuff out of the arc Right. Like yeah, if you it's if not... it's if it is on different data sets, then again you can set primary cache to metadata, and everything you will read from that not important data set will immediately be wiped out of Arc without it uh, influencing whatever you have impo important there. But it's per data set granularity; it can't be smaller. I was uh... thinking as some programmatic interface about POSIXF advice, which is called yeah. potentially where you can specify that this range of data you don't want to be cached. Right now, it's all practically not wired anywhere in ZFS, but if, if, we, could, if we could do it somehow, uh, since I implemented a primary cache, metadata primary cache disabled pro proper support, it's possible to specify for each read operation whether the result of this read operation should stay in ARC or not. If you say it shouldn't, then it will be wiped out. No, uh, it's uh, I don't remember his code name. It's uh, uh, POSIX F advice. Would the advice um, won't POSIX underscore F advice. Thank you. Thank so, you, POSIX F. Okay. Yeah, it's POSIX F advice, mm -hmm. and there you may specify something like uh, POSIX F adv don't need, and so or for F advice no reuse or whatever they are. None of those options are wired okay. anywhere right now. But if we could wire it, interesting. And, uh, there is, as I've told, uh, there is now a mechanism in ZFS to actually honor that on level of uh, debuff, read, DMU read. It's just uh, some, like right now it is, it, it is wired only to primary cache property, but nowhere else. Ah, okay. But only uh, what stays long enough in the arc to be considered for, wait a second, could you cause pathological behavior 
by doing that because then the, the the content would be dropped from the primary cache and be immediately considered uh, for being cached uh, as a victim in the L2 arc. So that if you evict from the arc effectively by with this, but there is no memory pressure, would this be misinterpreted as, oh, this is something I will need again, uh, no. put it in the L2 arc or? No, if yeah, you say uh, primary, if you say primary cache disabled, L2 arc will get nothing. So of in, course, uh, but if you do it with the M advice, so, so you, if you if you, if you wire it M advice to that flag which now uh, is controlled by uh, primary cache, then uh, data will just not they no, will not go to normal MRU MFU states from where oh. L2 arc is feeding. Okay, it will it, so it goes never... to special uncached state. It's never visible for L2 arc. Okay, right. thank you. That explains it. Because I was afraid that you would spam basically the victim uh, candidate queue uh, with the blocks you definitely don't want to cache. <laughs> but if it never goes to that queue for oh. candidates for the L2 arc to pick up, then uh, yeah, the, the pathological behavior is impossible and no such threat exists. Thank you. Didn't we discuss a simple caveman solution to this? That I that thought that was this, certainly with the with the property set. Yeah, the, well, his use right, case was close. that the tape appliance co consumes a snapshot via uh, NFS. And if a snapshot right, has the right caching property set, the expectation would be that it does not pollute the cache to scan through the snapshot, right? But to get the to get the the if it's a file system, you could just do a clone and set the metadata to uh, mm, primary not cache. Really. And why not? Because uh, then you have because the rights to the clone fork off from the rights to the original file system. Oh well, yeah, but if it's only for cloning, no ever reunite them. And if you're not okay. writing to one or the other, then you can use a snapshot. Yeah, there's no there's no reason to do the clone. It's just well, an unnecessary it, extra step. So the only question where to put primary cache property. Mm -hmm. If you put it on, onto the main data set, then whatever other process using it will also get uncached. So I guess um, trick with uh, clone with uh, snapshotting and cloning may allow it to set property specifically for a clone and then you'll be able to do whatever you make, want with it without caching. Yeah. Would it make sense to uh, make NullFS aware of this uh, mechanism so that you could have a NullFS with uh, different caching properties? No, how would ZFS differentiate it? Um, the, if you can do it inside of ZFS, do a read with different caching properties from the normal man point ones already, or the F advice or whatever. Uh, no, I, I, but you it, can't it, it, uh, feed this information into a ZFS through the normal read write system calls. So the idea would be if you have a null FS, first of all, because they would reference the same vnode underneath it, you wouldn't have a forking problem because it's the same file node underneath you are modifying. And uh, the writes would be annotated or the reads with the right caching properties. So the only way how could it be wired to uh, normal read write is through or direct or, uh, or, or whatever. I think there are a couple of flags, but uh, um, there are a number of different understanding what uh, or direct should do from different people. Ideally, or direct should be mapped to direct uh, IO patch we have on uh, upstream handling for a year or about. That would but, actually completely bypass cache. But maybe we could do that in finish. direct. Go ahead, Sorry? Alexander, if there's more. And then Jan. Yeah, uh, you cool. can already open files for direct IO. Yeah, but uh, right now is ZFS that still as bypassing the arc in, uh, in ZFS? It is not implemented. That's what I am saying. It could be implemented that way, uh, but it's not right now. But all of this assumes that you are in a position to modify the applications uh, to pick a non-default uh, caching behavior 
Whereas if you were able to have a nullfs mount point and configure the caching uh, properties on the mount point, uh, then you would only have to point the application to the respective mount point of the overlay. Yeah, but how? What caching is done on top of nullfs? I I bet close uh, to none. It would access the underlay uh, with the right caching properties you configure on as a mount option on nullfs. Then I'm not aware about caching property on nullfs. No, you so I, have... I don't think they are propagated anyhow to ZFS underneath. I don't think ZFS will see them any, any You problem. can have, hmm. there is an undocumented caching property. Oh, do uh, you know? uh, <laughs> Oh, no cache uh, in NullFS, but it is about uh, Vnode caching, cache we use so far. It's a workaround where, at least in the past, it used to be that the NullFS had the reference count for for the underlying file systems files at one and thereby uh, prevented it from ever, while the NullFS was mounted, uh, really deleting files hmm. because the NullFS would always keep a reference count at one. And I think that is sure has been fixed. Uh, and yeah. Interesting, okay. Borderline academic, but. Cool. Yeah, NullFS would uh, allow exactly that if you could put the the caching options on the on the NullFS mount point. Hmm. Interesting. What Greg is, I don't know. But it, the problem is that you would have to have DFS and NullFS pass these bits between the different file systems. Okay. Uh, and Greg, the original conversation was on January 10th, so feel free to scroll, scroll down on the doc, okay? Okay. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Daniel, what you got, if anything? Um, <clears throat> I have a, um, I, the only thing I have today is a, a purely theoretical question about, uh, about clustering file systems. And Let's say there was a, you know, the, I was chatting randomly with somebody on Discord about uh, potential upstream ideas. And one of the things that that came up was just sort of a, you know, a continuous, sort of a continuous uh, ZFS send receive socket that would that would then um, continue, continue the send and receive with any snapshot given to it. So you'd have an agent that's that does a snapshot, and then it would automatically receive on the other end. That's what uh, you know, probably something we all need in in one way or another. So I'm, I'm I was thinking about that and thinking about what obviously this is quite a bit different than how clustering file systems usually work. But what is, what's the overhead of of snapshot creation and and destruction in the background versus uh, you know, versus a, a a typical clustering file system that's that's you know, I mean, if you look at the guts of cluster FS, it's like a you know, it's creating and destroying a billion files all the time, which you know, obviously the the mechanics at the back end are are quite a bit different, but you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what can't ZFS do with a little elbow grease upstream? I mean, would that would that obsolete? Um, you know, clustering, if we could have uh, that and, and some other features married to it to, uh, you know, to keep, you know, multiple things in sync. I think the problem that you run into with, and, and this is not the first time, the, the idea of morphing ZFS into a clustered file system has come up. But the problem you run into is, at that point, ZFS is not designed to, to do that inner machine locking, like like uh, Gluster or any or any of those other uh, types of file uh, of distributed file systems are designed to do. So, right though, it does have metadata best... that could do that quite easily. No, well, no, not really. Okay. With the, but... I mean, it would have there would have to be a tiebreaker, but. You know, that's 
that's an agent in, in some way. I mean, Gluster is file system plus services. So, I mean, you would need plus services for ZFS as well. Um, it would at best be a eventually consistent replication stream. Exactly. You end, up, you end up with an eventually consistent replication stream. You don't end up with a we're not going to accept new stuff until we're consistent. But and then so it's already a valuable building block, exposing it directly to non-trivial applications. It gets very annoying because it feels so uh, enticing and easy in the beginning until you find out that there are so many corner cases you are now in charge of. Yep. Right. Uh, the old adage about it's open source. If you break it, you get to own the pieces. Uh, <laughs> comes to mind. Uh, or uh, rants about how MongoDB, uh, yeah, um, is almost as fast as as Def Null if you want to uh, replicate your data. But joking aside, uh, for. Uh, for example, for append only logs, maybe it's good enough. And what ZFS has, which may make it a bit less painful, is the transaction IDs don't wrap around. And if you could timestamp those, you could know basically where on the wall clock you are. Um, if you're more into practical systems than clean designs, having well enough synced wall clocks and knowing how stale you, your mirror is may be good enough for some applications. But it's not a general purpose cluster file system by any means. Yeah, you, yeah, you could definitely, if you had the right application, get away with it. But it's definitely not, not a general solution. You're going to have a hard time adapting it to a general solution. But if you have for a fast failover of some systems, I can imagine that it would be really need to have a way to not have to mirror so much data around. And if you have a service on top of that, which basically knows when the necessary replication factor is reached. So if you have a back channel from the replicas telling you, this is the latest transaction ID if I've completely persisted. And you could have a mechanism where you write to your pool uh, the asynchronous replication hopefully happens. Uh, at some point you get the replies back and then you can uh, tell the writer, yep, I've reached a replication factor of five, your data is safe sometime later. Mm -hmm. And if you, I don't know, if you run a object storage on top of ZFS, it's probably a useful building block. If you were to implement something, a subset of S3 or something. So you write the object, you get a re reply back telling you, yeah, it, it's there, but it's not yet durable. Now it's durable. So Daniel, do you right. want to write to both sides of that or is it just one way all the time, but pretty transparent? What? I um, mean, I, I can simulate this really easily with, yeah. uh, you know, with, with rolling scripts because, you know, I can, I can simply lock one side with read only. And then if the other one, if the other one asserts that it wants to write, you, you just flip the, flip the direction. If there was a, it, it, so I guess I guess the reason why I'm thinking about this, and and thank you for the thank you for the information. Of course, it it absolutely makes sense why clustering is different than what ZFS is doing. It just seems like the delta in overhead, where there's you know a clustering system and then a file system on top. That sounds like a lot of a lot of pieces. Um, and but but if the if the delta is just too much between what ZFS is and what a clustering uh, system is, then I guess it makes sense to have these specific edge cases where ZFS lives on top of cluster, like uh, like what Furman writes about. 
Uh, yeah, but uh, having looked at this about a year ago, I will just stand by my statement that I trust ZFS far more than any clustering file system I've seen. So the closer approximation we get at the sacrifice of a few features, I will sleep better at night. So there I said it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's some there's some magical sysadmin things like like hot failover and clustering and and things like that that we've all we've all done and we've all suffered with and you know and that the the value sound is is you know looks great on the shiny tin and then a year and a half into it when you're maintaining it it, it feels a lot less precious. But uh, anyway, it would be it would be an interesting interesting thing to have. I guess ZFS with the streaming component is something that sounds really delicious, and that's something that's absolutely within reach upstream. You know, in a year, I would say, uh, with the with the right so pressure. I think the streaming continuous replication uh, or the mechanism for it, if you can filter it would be also very valuable to both desktop users, uh, however few they are, and um, appliances like uh, Samba or something, where you want to have a continuous stream of the file system modifications with acceptable overhead to update uh, things like um, metadata, uh, based search engines like GNOME Tracker or something to uh, expose as uh, Spotlight compatible uh, SMB or AFP uh, server. But so that you have yeah. to have a way to, tra a better way to track the file system modifications than either opening all directories uh, and potentially all files to get file change notifications via KQ because that doesn't scale uh, or running ZFS diff all the time. Yes, Do Synology actually does something something like this. It has a mm -hmm. it has a one one button sync and it does some black magic with uh with what I assume butter on the on the back end that you know that either at least fakes this function so it looks transparent. You drop a you drop a file on one server and it's on you know it's on the other. Um, Same thing. I don't know. The only question: yeah. what, what to do when it's not uh, synchronized in time you expected? For example, you have some network mm -hmm. delays and so on, and then you lose primary copy. Then uh, you get some time frame where data are lost. What, what what will you do in that case? If you start using your copy at that point, you will never be able to return back some data mm -hmm. on original site will be lost permanently. You cannot continue that replication. You can only reliably detect that once you have a quorum again uh, to elect a new leader. And you have to accept this uh, basically vulnerability window. Anything which yeah, is no. not yet replicated is not durable in a cluster setting or in such a re replication setting. So you must consider that uh, as basically an uncommitted change. Which is why the application has to under really understand the semantics it gets because otherwise it looks like it's working until everything is fucked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did some. Ex I did some experimenting with having like um, um, block shares to, from two different locations that ran ZFS over top of them. But even that, we were only having one system that was accessing that data set at a time. Um, and in that in that format, it it worked. But the idea behind that was less, you know, what you do with a traditional clustering file system and more along the lines of, you know, what happens if this building gets hit by a giant space rock? Yep. What well, you yeah, can do CFS on, is... um... In situation yeah, when the original a... system dies and permanently and your best hope is just recover from copy, sure, continuous application is as good as you can get. 
but it doesn't give you guarantees. If you need guarantees, then you need to throttle any, every write, every modification to source size and source site until replication completes. And yeah, that's well, uh, not always acceptable. And do it, doing it this way, and ended up doing that throttling to till both sides completed because ZFS was handling was handling that and the transaction didn't com complete until both disks were written. The problem is between two different locations, that was god awful slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, because you have a network round trip in your synchronous white path. Uh, with something like GM gate, you get to uh, live close to the edge, but not completely beyond it by running it in a mode called memsync, where the remote system's memory is consist, uh, considered durable. So that hmm. you do a sync write to the local disk and a network write to the remote system. And when the remote system acknowledges that it has received the data and will do the sync write on its end, you consider that as good enough because the likelihood that both systems will um, die in this time window is quite low and you would have to have basically simultaneous panics or power losses on both systems. Mm, and then it's no worse than what file systems are already experiencing from uh, write back caches in uh, drives. So yeah. ZFF would be able to handle that and at worst it would be a single corrupted block which you have to fix up. Um, but this is basically distributing the block devices backing a single Z pool over multiple net, uh, nodes on a network so that you can then at least logically attach them on another system without having to move the physical disks around. Um, yeah, but it's not a clustered file system. It's a storage area network back backing your uh, virtual disks. And then you run ZFS on top of that. I will spare you my, my rant by just typing it and you can read it at your leisure. Anything Everyone else? Wants... I'm getting there. Thanks for everybody's comments. I uh, will use ZFS for what ZFS is good for. So then oh. if you want to prototype your idea, I think what you can do is basically sleep until the written property is non-zero. And then you start, once uh, something has written, uh, you wait a little bit so that you're similar to how uh, dynamic interrupt rate limiting on a network card works. So where as soon as you have a grace period, or once the you notice that the data set has a non-zero written, and then you try to start replicating again uh, until you're in sync. And then you check if you've caught up or if a data set tried. And so you have this continuous check for uh, modifications, replicate, check for modification, replicate. <laughs> Daniel, that was our conversation, you're, you're, was it not? Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, you're you're just yeah, you're, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm doing do doing a, doing a sim simplified version of that, but uh, yeah, I'd like to take it to the the next level and I'd, and you know and have something that can do something close to that until you know until such time as it's upstream. I mean, the and... the, the check for modification pays there should be stupid easy because all you have to do is see has my transaction group gone up. Yeah, Zelta sync dash capital or sorry, dash lowercase s will optionally snapshot if if the if there's enough written data. So yeah, my, my scripts already do all that. Yeah, and just for everyone, Daniel, you did some performance benchmarks on the metadata, and I think you had some surprises. Like some of them were cheap, some of them were pretty expensive by comparison. Do you recall what those were? Yeah, they're in. Um, <clears throat> they're they're they're. If you dig through GitHub, they they. This is a pretty common conversation, but yeah, yeah. create txg, don't do creation. 
So do the transaction group, if you look at the transaction group. And then of course, names and GUIDs are all free. So, but there, but anything, anything more than that will uh, have to step through each snapshot. So if you're doing lists of enormous sets of snapshots, it will take significantly uh, longer, like twice as long to do any, any list. So, um, um, yeah, one of the, one of the, um, yeah, I have a JSON output for, for my, um, hmm. uh, replication policy tool. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I time all of the, all of the lists. So it'll give oh, you nice. a hint about when to prune and stuff like that. Hmm. Daniel, can Great. you use, uh, DFS bookmarks basically as your replication markers? You love mentioning bookmarks, and I I tell you every week that I haven't bothered learning how to use because them. We're all struggling <laughs> for a use case. I mean, it's a new tool that was exciting, and someone because produced it. If I understand it correctly, you should be able to update them and then move along, and so that you don't interfere with the uh, intentionally cr manually created snapshots. And don't pollute the output, don't have to prune them out of the middle. And because you can busy update them, you can even, I'm wondering if there's a way to move them ahead so that you can add the source track where each replica is. So that the current source knows what's the, how far behind the replicas are. Wow, that's like a that's four dimensional chess of backups. You can actually track where everything came from and where they're going. That's uh, very interesting. Now, 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 I'm excited, and I'm going to end up writing for <laughs> writing all night or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how it happens. Okay, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn bookmarks because I because <laughs> I have to. I know ZREPL uses the bookmarks. Yeah, right. For what it's going to send, and and what it's and where its current hmm. point is. Are they super, super lightweight, non-obvious ways? Be it querying them or general yeah, problem with bookmarks same. usually is yeah, that you can replicate from bookmark but not to bookmark. Hmm. Bookmark, unlike snapshot, do not hold any data. Yeah, that's yeah. why yep. they are cheap. Uh, but uh, you cannot use them as target for replication. No, like this uh, like I, I replicate up to because data may get deleted once you sure, sure, sure. get some work. Uh, and that's going to help my and that's that's going to help a uh, human write CFS online. So that's going to help me do lists faster because. Uh, well, anyway, I'll, I have to learn how to use them. Whether I whether I end up uh, generally when when you're when you're listing uh, whatever data any data set snapshots whatever uh, just name and a uh, couple more fields available to you automatically. Well, primarily name and uh, whatever that store it in Zap uh, data set ID maybe something else not much. But if you need more, DFS has to read data from disks, and that's where traditionally things went very slow. Uh, to handle that, DFS has some special, special unevictable cache uh, of so fixed size, uh, something like uh, one and a half percent of RAM or something like that, pretty small. But the idea is that it should be enough to cover all the active data sets you have in the system. Maybe you could tune uh, that slightly higher if you need some more, if you have a lot of those. Um, regarding arc cache sizing and so on, I've looked into it, to ideas of how you could help automate what we talked, I think, two weeks ago about making it easy to limit the maximum arc cache and maybe also ensure a minimum arc cache size. Uh, and that, that, my that, cache is, that cache I'm talking about is not actually arc, it's a part of a uh, debuff cache, if I remember correctly. About no, but uh, those, those snapshots, uh, so data set information, oh, yeah, it, it is held. Just... It is it's held not in arc. It's held in debuff cache. It's an evictable yes. from debuff cache. Um, this is a different use case, uh, okay. but I looked into. So the idea was that 
uh, if, if I want to spin up a big virtual machine and I have to shrink the current arc size, uh, doing that by force is quite annoying because of the copy on write semantics of ZFS, everything has to allocate to write. So while the arc is uh, busy shrinking, the system feels like it stopped making progress. Actually, there was some, there was work a few years ago that should allow you to do some work while eviction. I think it's tunable mm -hmm. how much work is allowed while eviction. Yeah. There's oh, some really? percent. So the, cool. Yeah. But the the upper bound on the arc size so that you can avoid running uh, into the uh, contention between what's, let's say, your hypervisor and ZFS again and again over time as they grow and then shrink again and grow and shrink again. Uh -huh. um, so the, I looked at that and the quick and dirty idea I had was to have uh, because right now it's on FreeBSD, a SysTL, on Linux, a sort of file in SysFS. Huh. And a single file of SysTL isn't a good place for multiple writers. So the idea was to have a little helper daemon, which would monitor a directory. And then you would just put sparse files in there. And it would subtract the sum of the uh, size of all sparse files from the arc maximum and would basically keep a running sum of a bias to apply and maybe be smart enough to slowly apply the um, bias so that it, can you shrink a little, can you shrink a little so that it never thinks it's under too severe pressure. And then when it has caught up to uh, apply the next modification so that you can keep it in the it should still work state so that, yeah, of course, uh, for total throughput, this is probably a, a pessimization instead of an optimization. But if it feels responsive enough for the change, then it's probably for the user still an improvement. And I wanted to prototype that, but uh, right now uh, oh. I instead ended up writing my own event loop for KQ. <laughs> Well then, yeah, let us know when your prototype is ready, of course. Other topics, uh, questions, issues, wish list items. We're at what, an hour and 15, which is a pretty good sweet spot. Um, this is your call. Uh, let me know if you've got more. If not, we can meet in a week. And Alexander, I'm sorry you haven't been receiving notifications. Um, is if if you're missing, if you're on the email list in any way, let me know. But uh, I very much welcome your work and your presence. Uh, well, yeah, I've added that to my that calendar to my phone back again. Cool. Okay. it's a bit annoying. That's one calendar for both ZFS, Behive, and whatever the third. Hmm. I don't have. Uh, way to flexibly change them. Somehow, somehow uh, events from OpenZFS handle differently. Hmm. I see them on my normal calendar, not a separate one. Oh, but weird. Okay. I, I haven't looked how it works. No idea. Cool. But I'll Anything try else, to okay, Cool. Yeah, I, yeah. It's great to hear from you and because you've got answers that are laser focused definitive. You wrote the code. Anything else? Well, then I'm going to say thank you, everyone, and catch you on the Beehive call tomorrow, if you like. Okay? I'll talk to you later. Like and subscribe. Have a good day, folks. Bye. Thanks, all. Bye.